Today on Brook Horse, we'll be discussing the three-toed box turtle, which is a common pet in America. It originally comes from the East Coast. But before we talk about some of the specifics of their care, let's talk briefly about the difference between a tortoise and a turtle. Despite what it might look like, this is an example of a true turtle and not a tortoise. A tortoise is associated with desert environments and can retain water for long periods of time and mostly gets water from what it eats. A turtle, in contrast, is happy in the water and does not usually retain water as effectively. They're also designed for swimming in the water. They mostly have flat and streamlined shells, whereas tortoises have domed shells that protect them from being crushed in the jaws of a predator. Tortoises typically have shells that are heavier, and turtles typically have shells that are lighter weight. In fact, it can be somewhat flexible, again, that aids them in swimming in the water. Tortoise feet are designed for walking and digging, whereas turtles are designed for swimming. They have webbed feet with long claws. Most tortoises are herbivores, but some can ingest live food. Turtles are omnivores. They can handle fruits, vegetables, leafy vegetation, basically almost anything. Tortoise hatchlings move from their nest to their mother's burrow soon after birth. This is, of course, in a desert environment. The burrow would be relatively moist and more protected than being out in an arid environment. Turtles, in contrast, stay in the nest on their own, and then, after they hatch, they are on their own. Tortoises can live 80 to 150 years, the longest perhaps 326 years. Turtles don't live as long, 20 to 40 years. The oldest was about 86 years old. Tortoises are a very ancient order. They have appeared in the fossil record since before the time of the dinosaurs. It's a very effective design, and although some people would say they're primitive, in fact, their behavior is anything but. You just have to have patience and observe their behavior on their time scale rather than yours. The three-toed box turtle, scientific name Terrapine carolina triunguis, is a subspecies within the genus of hinge shell turtles, commonly referred to as box turtles, likely because many people keep them in boxes as pets. This subspecies is native to the south central part of the United States and is the official reptile of the state of Missouri. Three-toed box turtles are so named due to the number of toes on the back feet. Of course, on the front feet, they have five toes, just like humans have five fingers, following a general vertebrate body plan. Some people think there are four-toed examples also. However, there's other speculation saying that the four-toed individuals are actually eastern box turtle and three-toed box turtle hybrids. The three-toed box turtles have a domed shell which grows to an average length of 4.5 to 5 inches. The record shell length for this subspecies is 7 inches. In the males, the head and throat often display yellow, red, or orange spots. Despite the fact that there are a few red and uh, orange spots on this example, it is a female and enjoying its meal of fish. From the west to east of its range, the three-toed box turtle can be found from eastern Texas to the northern edge of the Florida Panhandle. Its northernmost habitat is in Missouri and Kansas, while the southernmost is in Louisiana. As mentioned previously, three toads interbreed with other subspecies of eastern box turtles, which would explain why if you see something labeled as an eastern box turtle, you can have a variety of different phenotypes. The upper shell of the turtle is called the carapace. 
the lower shell that encases the belly is called the plastron. The carapace and the plastron are joined together on the turtle sides by bony structures called bridges. The inner layer of a turtle shell is made up of about 60 bones that includes portions of the backbone and the ribs, meaning the turtle cannot crawl out of its shell. In most turtles, the outer layer of the shell is covered by horny scales called scutes that are part of its outer skin, or epidermis. Scutes are made up of the fibrous protein keratin that also make up the scales of other reptiles. These scutes overlap the seams between the shell bones and add strength to the shell. Some turtles do not have a horny scoot. For example, the leatherback sea turtle or the soft shell turtles do not have scutes, but they have a leathery shell instead. The shape of the shell gives clues as to how the turtle lives. Most tortoises and some turtles, like this three-toed box turtle, have a dome-shaped shell that makes it difficult for predators to crush the shell between their jaws. This one has clear bite marks in the shell. Obviously a predator tried to crush and failed to crush this animal. This animal is also a female. You can see the bottom of the shell is flat rather than concave. Three-toed box turtles are very easy to feed. This one is eating a combination of grapes as well as crab classic, which is an imitation crab made of fish. In nature, their diets vary with the availability of food and according to season. They particularly like earthworms, insects, snails, slugs, and they also like fruit, like strawberries, colored fruit. They can also eat mushrooms, and they will enjoy green leaf vegetation, including salads. They can have this every day, although, of course, you cannot rely on salad to provide all of their nutritional needs. They have been observed in nature eating the eggs of quail, but it should be noted that, as a rule, box turtles prefer live foods to vegetation. They're stimulated by the activity of crickets and they will actively chase around crickets. You might assume that, assume that they're not fast enough to catch crickets, but they are. They'll also eat, with great gusto, mealworms and waxworms. Of course, waxworms, being very high fat, shouldn't be fed to them in great numbers. People have also reported they eat cooked eggs as well as moist dog food. Uh, these turtles don't seem to like moist dog food. As a rule, they're a little bit skittish about people watching them when they're eating, and they may stop and stare back when you watch. However, over time, they get used to a human presence. In the wild, three-toed box turtles are known to migrate seasonally in order to maintain their preferred humidity level. For example, in Arkansas, three-toed box turtles were observed in grasslands in late spring, while in early spring, summer, and late fall, they were found in forested areas. During dry times, they dig shallow burrows into leaf litter to conserve moisture. When water is available, these turtles soak for longer periods of time than any of the other subspecies. Here you can see the male, who is a bit confused as to why there is no water in his dish. The two females on the right-hand side are relaxing. One seems to be interested in the cuddle bone. It is important for these turtles to have sources of calcium easily available for them. On the far right is their heat stone. Three-toed box turtles require care similar to that of all eastern box turtles, faring best in large outdoor enclosures. 
These enclosures should have plenty of room to allow the turtle to burrow, but should also be protected to prevent the turtle from burrowing under the enclosure fencing. Indoors, three-toed box turtles should be kept in a large wooden enclosure or a large tub, at least 30 gallons for a single turtle. Now, the female, who is now moving towards the male in the middle of the tank, was purchased about 50 years ago. The male, about 40 years ago, and the female on the far right is only purchased about five years ago. These turtles have had very standard care in that they are put in this tank or one very similar, a bit over 50 gallons in the evening, but they're allowed to wander outside in an enclosure at night. They're taken in in the evening to avoid predators. Predators can be very vicious when it comes to turtles and turtles can be rather inquisitive about something. They can even stick their heads out of an enclosure, out of a wire cage, and that would leave them open to being killed very easily by something like a raccoon or a skunk. That's why they're taken in at night and put into this tank. A tank is not ideal because, of course, it took these turtles a long time to recognize what glass was. And during that time, you can use wallpaper or you can tape paper on the outside of the tank to make it clear that there is a natural barrier. The enclosure should have a high temperature side with a heat bulb around 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And it includes also a basking rock that is plugged into an outlet, that basking rock is on the right side, and it should have a cooler area of about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Ideally, the water should be provided all the time for these turtles. They really enjoy soaking. Some people keep them on a peat moss or a shavings bedding with around 80% humidity, so they keep it always moist. Desert materials like gravel or sand are very difficult for these turtles to dig into and are not ideal if you were to keep these indoors all year long. Of course, it's okay in this example because these turtles are outside most of the time. Many owners spray the surface area of the enclosure at the beginning of the day in order to keep the humidity up. Now, these turtles don't seem to be particularly sensitive to uh, humidity. It's uh, California, it's fairly arid here. They can go for one day without water, but probably not two days and definitely not three days. It would be okay to dry out the tank every once in a while to make sure it doesn't get moldy but it would not be a good idea to let these turtles dry out. These are not tortoises, they're turtles. One trick that helps with a dry shell, which three-toed box turtles can easily get in an arid climate, is to use coconut oil to moisturize and brighten the shell. Here I've kind of restrained this female who is uh, eating a meal and I will soon rub her shell down with a coating of coconut oil. This is very easy to do starting from the top and of course because it's coconut oil it's not dangerous to humans either. It will take about half an hour for the oil to really penetrate the shell and you can add a little bit to the limbs also. They don't seem to really mind the oil, but of course, unlike humans, I don't think they're particularly vain. Here is the same turtle after about half an hour, 
As you can see, although she is well over 50 years old, I think she looks pretty good. The shell looks really moisturized and there is some debate. Uh, some people are worried that doing this too often might hurt their turtle. It seems as if done irregularly once every several months, it probably can't hurt. And it looks like it can help, particularly a dry shell that uh, is quite common in arid environments, uh, Northern California, places well out of uh, the natural range for this species. This is a good example of one way of keeping three-toed box turtles outside. Some people have very good results keeping these turtles inside and using artificial light, particularly light that is designed for reptiles, uh, a UV supplemented light. I think it's always a good idea to use natural sunlight so that the turtles can get natural UV and they can gauge how much they need or don't need during the day. I've found in general they bask in the morning and in the later afternoon. In the middle of the day, direct light and hot, they tend to hide. So the top of the cage has a shield and there is also a plastic step in the left side of the cage where the turtles can get shielding from light and a bit of shielding from anything that may disturb them. A very important feature of their enclosure is water and that's provided in a glass baking dish on the right side. These turtles like soaking in water but you might not see when they do most of their soaking. That can occur before sunrise and it can occur particularly later in the day although on a very hot day they will also soak in the water. They drink not only by putting their heads in the water but they drink from soaking so that it's good to let them sit and soak as long as they want. They also defecate in the water. A wire cage is very good because it allows you to move from place to place. It allows you to change the substrate. You can add, for instance, wood chips. You can add uh, peat moss. You can change it up anytime you want, basically. With a permanent enclosure, I think it's a good idea to give them a bit of variability in, in their uh, surroundings, just so they don't get uh, too cage bound. They seem to enjoy having different things in their cage and in fact in the morning these turtles want to go outside. In the evening they don't particularly want to go back although it is important that they go back in the evening. The cage is a little bit too exposed to predators. The turtles can stick their limbs out of the cage and unfortunately a skunk or raccoon that particularly come out at night could hurt them. It's very important to make sure nothing goes wrong with their enclosure. For instance, that the water dish isn't flipped over or that uh, one turtle hasn't done something stupid. Very occasionally they will climb and they can get stuck. This is an easy problem to fix as you can simply rescue the turtle. This afternoon I'd like to say a few things about the intelligence of reptiles. And the fable of the race between the tortoise and the hare suggests some problems that uh, experimental psychologists might face in dealing with tortoises. Now, as is well known, a hare is faster than a tortoise but a tortoise is slow and steady and if the hare is busy playing around a tortoise could indeed win a race by getting there if the tortoise is dedicated enough if the tortoise has the right thing in mind now i'm drawing particularly on the research of anna wilkinson uh, her academic papers are all over the internet and she found a way to motivate red-footed tortoises. 
Now, specifically in an experiment she did with Jeffrey Hall, she constructed an eight-armed radial maze structure that was baited with food at the tip of every arm. It was found that after a few tries, red-footed tortoises were able to go one way, in other words, the way they had not gone before, and get the food. This shows that tortoises, despite the fact that they have a very different brain architecture than mammals, can form memories and they can plan. In fact, it could be said that for some things, tortoises are just as good or perhaps better than the favored experimental animal, which is the lab rat. The rat, of course, is easier as an experimental animal because it is warm-blooded. It does not require high temperatures and you don't have to wait that long for the rat to make up his mind and actually complete an action. Another fascinating study shows that there is social cognition in tortoises. Social cognition, particularly gaze following. Now, many species have gaze avoidance or gaze sensitivity. It's something like the evil eye. They do not like being looked at. In the wild, this makes perfect sense because if a creature is looking intently at you, it might be interested in eating you. In a social environment, a species that would be staring intently at something, particularly of the same species you are, and perhaps uh, in a non-carnivorous species, there could be a feeding opportunity ahead. That would mean that following the gaze could lead you to food. This is fascinating because tortoises are usually non-social animals and the young do not have a period of dependency on their parents so that this gaze following comes as somewhat of a surprise. But it does suggest that uh, gaze following emerged in the reptiles and perhaps can be traced all the way through mammals to us. There are no doubt a variety of other behaviors that tortoises exhibit that with careful science can be brought out so that people can debate them and consider them particularly in light of the evolutionary tree, perhaps even leading us to a greater understanding of ourselves. The next decades will be very interesting. Thank you very much.